We truly do not know what is going on in this world. Everything is strange, people are cruel, and the technology is horrifying. Despite all of the mind control and parasitic worms we've discussed in the past, I think this piece of tech we'll see today truly takes the cake. Welcome to the Inside Lore series where in today's episode we will be discussing the shockwave section and the flooded labs. This video will be divided up into two sections, the first being all in-game confirmed information and the second being my own theories about the overarching story within the world of Inside. Standing before, perhaps, the most dangerous piece of technology the boy has ever encountered, he takes cover behind a barricade as a massive shockwave nearly splatters him. And that's not an exaggeration. If the boy is hit directly with this shockwave, he is blown to literal bits. We can't see where this shockwave is coming from or really why it is in use. However, as we move along, we run into a room full of crash test dummies, which, to me, hints at this shockwave thing being relatively new. Moving along, the boy makes it past the shockwave thing and finds an elevator. Yet, as he's going down, a shockwave hits the elevator, knocking it down and causing the boy to fall into more of the flooded city. Parkouring into a lab that is oddly pristine, albeit flooded, he eventually finds another one of these long-haired creatures that, after this great comment suggestion, I'll call a Rasalka, because it seems to be a very fitting name. What's interesting about this Rasalka in particular is the fact that it has a collection of wires jutting out of its stomach, further confirming that they are indeed experiments. With nowhere else to go but in the water, the boy dives in. Yet, the Rasalka has seemingly moved, but is still drifting aimlessly in the water, like it has been lulled to sleep. Approaching it in this state results in nothing happening. However, moving past it results in the creature locking onto us and attacking. If caught, it will latch on and drown the boy just like before. Escaping by getting out of the water, the creature reaches helplessly as we escape to the surface. The way it reaches for the boy, yet never actually exits the water, tells me it can only survive in the water. After escaping the Rasalka and moving deeper into the facility, something unforeseen happens. Right before we're about to escape, the catwalk gives out, causing the boy to fall into the water. He is instantly grabbed and drowned by a different Rasalka. The one that was chasing us before throughout the lab had all those wires still attached to it, while this one doesn't. The Rasalka takes us down to the depths, where it grabs a device and injects some kind of glowing thing into our stomachs. It leaves us as we sink further and further down into the depths. Fish begin to circle us, like the chicks in the beginning. As we land at the bottom of the flooded city, illuminated by a single light and surrounded by discarded VHS tapes. Out of nowhere, the boy recovers and learns he can now breathe underwater. In the foreground, a headless and limbless body is stuck to some kind of wire as it's being eaten by smaller fish. Occasionally, this body twitches too. Next to it, we can see an even more disfigured and bulbous body that is also stuck to some wires as well as being eaten by fish. Exploring around, we find more and more bodies drifting aimlessly in the background. We eventually find a flooded lab that basically confirms that these bodies we keep seeing were test subjects at one point. But it goes deeper than that. After finding and disabling another orb, we make it through a fan system that seems to be chopping up these bodies. As we reach a safe haven, we find more bodies drifting in the shallow waters, with rats gnawing on them and flies buzzing around in the background. Seeing as a limb is tossed down as we explore, this area we're in appears to be a biological waste disposal site. Biological waste being human body parts. Doing another little puzzle, we can find another orb, and after getting past a spotlight, can find a pod filled with more fish. There's nothing in here, but it reminds me of the Huddle's pod, which we'll soon see, so more on that later. The boy continues along and finds some of those pods we found in the forest still under construction. The boy eventually reaches an odd sight. Bodies are being suspended in the air, held aloft by water, seemingly breaking the laws of physics. What this is, we'll discuss next time. So, the big set piece, the shockwave. It is shocking, huh? By all accounts, especially on your first playthrough. It just kind of comes out of nowhere and gives you that same ASMR feeling you get when you hear a seismic charge go off. But what's the point? What is this shockwave thing? As I said, I believe it is a fairly new invention, perhaps on its first test run, as we can see debris striking the building. 
breaking off chunks. If it were in continual use for a long while, I'd imagine the building itself would be in far worse shape. Nevertheless, what is its purpose? It's a continual shockwave protecting the survivors. Again, the theory we've been working with is a global parasitic worm pandemic destroyed everything. This city the boy is breaking into may be the last bastion of humanity. Sure, you can have guards watching for infected about to breach the walls or those taser turret things, but they're fallible. They could miss a massive continual shockwave that splatters any organic material with one blast? That's not fallible. I imagine the quote-unquote last city of humanity being divided into layers, Attack on Titan style. We start in the outer layer, out in the woods, and work our way in. The exterior city, the flooded district, the construction site, the shockwave, the lab, and so on. It's like safe haven, kill you, safe haven, kill you, etc. Instead of walls dividing the city, it's something dangerous to keep the infected out on each layer. Moving along, what I consider to be the most interesting part of the game, the long-haired Rasulka creatures. What's the point of them? Well, as we can clearly see, a large portion of this world is flooded. Now, I originally theorized that this was the doing of the survivors to stem the flow of infected, but now I'm beginning to think it's something more. If this is indeed all about parasitic worms infecting the world and destroying humanity, then what would be a good environmental reason for these parasites to jump to humanity in the first place? Well, I think it might be global warming. What if the polar caps melted and a massive amount of the world was flooded? Then, in the changing ecosystem, these worms, who reproduce in the water, made the jump from bugs to pigs, then to humans. So, in this post-apocalyptic flooded world, where most of the world is underwater, many scientists have been experimenting with humans to allow them to breathe underwater. So perhaps these Rasulka are early prototypes. If they can create a new breed of humans capable of breathing underwater, then they can take back their lost world. I imagine the Rasulka we see are very early examples of the program, and that's why they are hyper-violent and drown us on sight. Yet the one that injects us with the mysterious device may have been a completed prototype which is why it helps us rather than kills us. But why is it helping us? I really have no idea. Perhaps it's being controlled by the huddle. If the Rasulka was in cahoots with the scientist controlling the boy, then I don't think he'd be flailing as much when it grabs him. Nor would this sequence happen by accident. I'd imagine it'd be far more deliberate. Regardless, things are heating up, and more pieces are falling into place as we inch ever closer to the end. As we delve deeper into the labyrinth of inside, the pieces of the puzzle align bringing us closer to the eventual truth.